In the next few videos, we're going to talk about solutions to canonical Dirichlet problems. So these are two specific problems. The first is the Dirichlet problem in a circular disk, and the second is the Dirichlet problem in the upper half plane. The idea is that we want to be able to extend the usefulness of this conformal mapping that we've been discussing to a broader set of domains. In other words, we want to have additional targets for the conformal mapping from the z-plane to the w-plane. So we call these standard or canonical geometries into which we can map our more complex domains and thereby solve Laplace's equation. So the two problems we're going to look at are, again, the upper half plane as well as the interior of a circle. And these are called Poisson integral formulas. I'm just going to sketch the process by which we get these results, but I want to focus on the Poisson integral formulas themselves. So we're going to consider the Dirichlet problem in a circular disk. Again, the Dirichlet problem is governed by Laplace's equation with fixed values of the dependent variable around the entire boundary. So here we're going to have a circle centered at the origin of radius capital R. And we want to determine, given boundary conditions at every point on that circular disk, what is the value of the dependent variable phi of little r theta throughout that entire domain. So the r theta z is going to be a generic point on the in the interior of the domain. And capital R sigma will be values of phi on the boundary. So here we have Laplace's equation written in polar or cylindrical coordinates for the dependent variable phi throughout the geometry. And then in addition to Laplace's equation, we have the Dirichlet boundary conditions where phi on the boundary, so the little r is r and, and theta is sigma, is known. It's some known function, little f of sigma. Those are the values of phi along the entire bounding curve. Now there are a few approaches that we can use to get the Poisson integral formula, the solution to the Laplace equation in the circular disk. I'll show one based on separation of variables here and mention a couple more at the end of the video. So in, remember, in separation of variables, we take our dependent variable, which is a function of r and theta, and we suppose that we can divide it up into the product of two functions, one a function of one variable, one the function of the other. Now this is grayed out. I'm not going to go through the details. You can look in the notes, which are available on the website, if you want to see those details. I'm just going to show you the basic result. So separation of variables typically results in an eigenfunction solution. In this case, it looks like this. So you see you have r to the n's, where n's are integers, and we have cosines of n thetas and sines of n thetas. So it, it looks like it's related to a Fourier series. And in fact, when we get the boundary conditions, you'll see that it is. When we do apply this, when r is equal to capital R and theta is equal to sigma, so on the boundary, then the value phi is the f of sigma. Those are the boundary conditions. And then we have this expression 229. And then you get the coefficients e, g, n, and h, n that are in the eigenfunction expansion uh, using Fourier series expansions. So again, the f of sigma, f of sigma, f of sigma show up in these integrals. You perform the integrals, you get the values of the Fourier series expansion coefficients. Now normally when you do separation of variables, eigenfunction solution expansions, as in matrix methods chapter 3, this is the end result. You get your eigenfunction expansion and you're done. In fact, in this case, someone has figured out that you can actually sum the series. So you take that series, again the details are here, I'm not going to go over them, you can look in the notes if you wish. You can sum the series to get a closed form integral solution. And this is what it looks like. So this is our first of the Poisson integral formulas, and this is the solution to the Dirichlet problem in a circular disk of radius capital R. So let's just walk through it. So this is the value of phi at any r theta within the interior of the circular disk. Capital R, of course, is the radius of the disk. And you see that here and here. And remember, theta is the argument in, for points inside the domain and sigma is the argument for points on the domain boundary. So we're integrating around the boundary, and the boundary conditions are given by the phi of capital R sigma here. That's the f of sigma that we're, not, that, that we're given, boundary conditions on the circular boundary. All right, so given the boundary conditions, 
this is the integral that we would have to evaluate. There's a couple other ways to get these. One is through the Cauchy integral formula, which we haven't covered yet, so I haven't done it that way. It's much more concise, much more direct way to get it. You can also get the Poisson integral formula using Green's functions. So again, the whole point of the Poisson integral formula is it allows us to get the phi of r theta, so the values of the dependent variable everywhere throughout the domain, based on the solution phi of capital R sigma boundary conditions on the boundary. Now, except for very, very simple forms of f of sigma, the boundary conditions, the Poisson integral formula in the circuit of this cannot be integrated in closed form. We would have to use numerical methods to approximate the solution. Alternatively, you could use the Fourier series approach that we have shown. Now, there's a couple of interesting mathematical results that you can get from this that actually have uh, an intuitive interpretation that makes sense. So these hold for any Dirichlet problem. The first one is known as Gauss's mean value theorem. Now I have here on the slide the formal mathematical statements of these theorems, but I'll just give you the basic results in layman's terms. So Gauss's mean value theorem says the following. If I have a circular domain, if I take the point at the center of the circle, the value of phi at the center is simply the average of the values of phi along the entire circular boundary, which intuitively makes sense. The second one is known as the maximum and minimum modulus theorems. Again, you can see the, the wordy formal statement of the theorems here. What it basically says is for these Dirichlet problems, solutions of Laplace equation with fixed boundary conditions along the entire boundary, the maximum and minimum values of phi are on the boundary. Now that makes sense. You think about that from a heat transfer point of view. If I take a, a metal rod and stick it in a fire, the, the temperature within the rod will never be higher than that of the fire and will never be colder than that of the ambient air around the rod. So that makes sense and you can prove that mathematically.